party. Um, these meetings are recorded and available on our YouTube channel. And over the last, I want to say even four years now, we've built a really strong community um, of people who follow the Cloud Cafes. And unfortunately, we seem to be up against uh, the England versus Netherlands game today. So um, we might have... Um, a good uh, amount of people signed up but then less people joining us on the day but uh, we do have a lot of people who um, watch these after the fact and I know that after the success in England this week um, and the European elections happening so recently there's a lot to talk about in terms of um, the Green Party and their influence in Britain and Europe so that is the subject that we're talking about today we've got three fantastic speaking speakers joining us from all over Europe um, and what we'll be talking about is as people seem to be turning away from the two main parties especially in Britain and deciding to um, follow their heart a little bit more with regards to where they put their vote uh, and also with the climate emergency sustainability the cost of living crisis all becoming uh, much bigger impacts and, and, and front of mind for a lot of voters we know that um, the Green Party is becoming stronger and having more of an influence within Parliament in Britain, but also um, in Europe. So our first speaker um, is actually uh, homegrown from Gloucestershire, uh, and uh, his, his name is Seth Piper. Uh, he's formerly a marketing campaign advisor for the Green Party in Norway, um, and is now a senior consultant working with non-profit organisations in Norway. But I know his background um goes much further and wider than that and he is a very fascinating guy so welcome Seth and thank you for joining us. Thanks a lot Jenny it's really nice to be here and to see everyone. Um, yeah I'm Seth I'm, I've been involved with Greens in a bunch of countries I'm going to talk a bit about that um, but I was in England last week knocking on doors on election day getting out the vote like probably some of you and it was amazing <laughs> I was really like ecstatic for days and days I had blisters all over my feet but it was it was worth it so well done everyone and well done on your local results as well in May incredible so okay I'm going to share my presentation um as Seth is sharing I'm just forgot to say if you have any questions as he's talking then please drop them into the chat and we'll come to all the questions at the end of the session thanks everyone thanks Seth. Okay, and uh, Jenny, let me know if I'm going over time or anything. I don't have a lot to show today. So yeah, I'm Seth. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, how the Greens broke through in Norway over the last 10 years and what we've been able to achieve at a local level. Um, this is a bit of my background. So I've been involved in a bunch of different Green organizations over the years. Uh, the latest was working with Maria, who's talking next, I think, or uh, yeah, today in Sweden, but before that, um, in three different roles at the Norwegian Greens. Um, I'm gonna talk about my role as campaign manager in 2019, which is when we got our biggest result today. So I'm gonna say a bit about, yeah, how we how did we do it? How did we win? And then what did we do when we, when we did win? Um, this was uh, at the time in 2015, the first uh, breakthrough for the Greens. As you can see, there's a lot of parties in a proportional system. <laughs> We have a lot of competition. There's at least two other parties that call themselves green. Um, but yeah, 2015, we broke through. And in fact, as you can see right in the middle, we were the kingmakers because that's how it works. We were placed in the middle. So we decided whether the Conservatives or the Labour administration was going to uh, run Oslo City Council. And we went into coalition with the, the Labour and the Socialists left. And that coalition lasted for eight years. Um, so in 2018, we I was hired to start the um, the campaign for re-election in 2019. So the, the, from the first to the second term, and we had a big ambition. We wanted to double our vote share from eight uh, percent to to fifteen percent. And uh, luckily in 2018, I was able to. I was uh, I attended campaign school with Chris Williams and some other people, Amelia. Uh, so yeah, I got to learn about target to win, and decided you know target to win. This is this is definitely going to work in Norway as well. I've talked about this before. Um, so we borrowed some of it, the door knocking, which I don't have really many pictures of. And we made up some other things, which were just for Norway. So what you can see here is uh, two ground activities we did. We did on the right, you can see the high five actions. 
So uh, we had a lot of, uh, we were high, uh, cycling was a, an issue that we were really profile had high profile on. And we got the candidate there on the left to go out and high five cyclists in the morning. And um, it worked really well. You know, we had a lot of voter contacts and um, people appreciated what we'd done already in the previous uh, four years in clearing space for, for cycling and promoting cycling. And we did these sticker polls on the left, which is where we we presented people with um, before and after pictures, showing all the things we'd done to kind of empty the streets of cars. Uh, and we asked people what they thought without, instead of telling them, we gave them an opportunity to say what they thought. People love that stuff. But yeah, we also knocked on a lot of doors, 40,000 doors. Um, I wanted to show you a bit of the hybrid campaigning as I call it. So it was somewhere between digital and analog. And we asked people for suggestions about where would they like a bike lane? Where would they like a, a park? Where should we um, pedestrianize? That kind of thing. Because again, these are our key issues. And um, people gave us lots of feedback. So if you've done 60 second surveys in the UK, you know uh, how valuable it is to ask people what they think. Um, so this is our candidate again. This is on election night. And... Um, we had a very strong and maybe a bit controversial message all the way through the campaign. The big issue was on road tolls. So whether we should have uh, high road tolls to prevent people from driving into the city or whether we should have them low because, you know, it costs people money. So we we had we were the only party that had a clear message and we said we love the road tolls. And we said it again and again and again. And, and frankly, it's the only thing people remember from that election campaign because it was such a clear message and... Um, it divided people one way or the other. And we, we definitely earned a lot of attention on that, that issue. Here's a bit of our printed material, which we did. Uh, we did uh, four rounds of deliveries. We did stuff, a lot of get out the vote stuff, which again is all very familiar to you in the in the England and Wales, but quite unusual in Norway. Uh, we broke with tradition with a lot of this stuff and um, I won't spoil the result, but uh, yeah, <laughs> it turned out that was uh, that paid off. We also did an SMS. Y youth voters are notoriously hard to get out and get to the voting um, voting booths. So we sent out 90,000 SMSs to everybody in Oslo under the age of 30, basically, which again was controversial, but it was it, it did the job. Um, and we also worked really hard to create kind of winner vibes around the campaign because basically people want to be on the winning team. Uh, again, we have a lot of competition and and um, people want to say, and we saw it last week in the general election, I think, that you know it, it benefited Labour. Everybody knew they were going to win and some people wanted to share in the win. So that's how they voted for us. Here on the left is some of our wonderful, wonderful volunteers. We had 800 reg registered volunteers. It was a massive campaign. Uh, we also benefited from the green wave. You know, 2019 was when Greta Thunberg uh, broke through and um, there were we had a lot of youth activists coming out for us and, and voting. So here is the result. We're very proud of it. We were the third biggest party, still the third biggest party in Oslo. Um, and once again, that meant we were the kingmakers. Basically, there was no administration without the Greens. Um, of course, it's better to be the biggest party like you are in Stroud and we are in Bristol. And uh, so, you know, uh, but for, for us, this was a big deal. We got 15% of the vote in 2019. And in, in a couple of the uh, central wards, we got, we were the biggest party. So that was crazy. A lot of the political commentators were a bit shocked about that. So what happened? What was the point of all this? I'm going to talk a bit about, um, I mean, if you're an elected politician, elections are great. That's a big part of what you do, but it's not everything. So during the two terms, um, Oslo was quite transformed. If you visited, you might see some differences if, if you come back. Um, a lot of the streets used to be filled with, with uh, parked cars, which a lot of streets in the UK still are. And because it's up to the council to decide whether or not people have on-street parking, we took away as much as we could. And, uh, you know, people's experience uh, walking and cycling was transformed. Mm, we started subsidizing uh, electric bikes, you know, for business owners, for for individuals, uh, so people could afford to get rid of their car. We cleaned the uh, bike lanes of snow, which is a huge problem. It's not such a problem in Stroud, I don't think. But um, in Norway, for several months, you really can't ride a bike or you're stuck in, in traffic. 
So this was prioritized um, to a big extent. So the network is pretty good. And this here is um, the air pollution, which uh, Oslo had a chronic problem of air pollution. Some days in the winter, every winter, um, asthmatics were told that they were not allowed, they shouldn't leave their, their houses, it's too dangerous. And that's because nobody was standing up to the, the fossil fuel powered cars. So we, again, did put a lot of restrictions on them, uh, plenty of electric cars um, in the way. And um, it's not an issue anymore. I mean, it's basically solved, which is great, but also it's, you can't campaign on it anymore. So that's the hard, that's the hard thing. Um, and then famously, this went all around the world. Uh, the ambition was to ban all private vehicles from the city center. You know, there was a lot of compromise in the end. Um, the interesting thing is that this was a policy that nobody really agreed with in 2015. And instead of just being responsive, Greens were making the case for it and acting. And once again, what you see is public opinion switches and comes around to radical policies. If you're brave and bold, if you have political elected leaders who take bold steps for everybody's good, even if it seems like there's a lot of opposition, like the ULES stuff, people will come around to it. And it's just a very small and very vocal number of people who, who hate it. So yeah, there was this was all capped off in the same year that we were uh, we ran for re-election. We were named the European Green Capital and uh, uh, it was a lot, it was it was a really nice year. Election night was a lot, a lot of fun. But what comes next? So unfortunately, so this slide shows the um the polling averages for the Greens. The second we'd run won the election in 2019, 2019, all of the campaigning stopped. You know, this is the thing you're told not to do. Um, is you know, you don't stop delivering the newsletters, you don't stop having those conversations with the voters because those things are linked. And so we had a chance really to to grow and it, it was all lost. So, and this, honestly, a lot of European Greens have had this, has seen the same thing, like vote share peaked in 2019. Well, for whatever, for whatever reason, those those voters started to kind of drift away. Um, so the, the, the European election results were, it was quite a contrast 2019 to 2024, sadly. But, you know, you've got to be constructive. Uh, one of the things we did in Sweden, so we, Marie's going to talk a bit about this, I think. We did, um, this is, um, uh, we had seven or eight, uh, people come from Stockholm uh, to campaign in the local elections in May 2022. It was really fun. So we campaigned in Lambeth with um, Pete Elliott, if anybody knows uh, Pete, just because I was really I was really determined to to keep building on this, uh, how to implement target to win in a proportional European context. Uh, so that's uh, really fun. I invited all these guys to come back again for the European elections, uh, for the, sorry, for the general elections now. Um, they're keen to come back at some point. Um, but yeah, here's the, the last slide I've got tonight. Um, these are more examples from Sweden uh, from 2022, where we did pretty okay. And Maria, I'm not going to spoil Maria's presentation, but we have reached further. Greens have reached further in Sweden, let's say. And uh, we had to stand for re-election and we did pretty well. Uh, this is Stockholm. Yeah, that's all I'm going to talk about tonight. Look forward to your questions. Thanks so much, Seth, for kicking us off. I think it's um, always very interesting. I will come to you in one second, Liz. I can see your hand. Um, it's always very interesting hearing about uh, European campaigning because in England, I always feel like we have to dilute our messaging and it's so nice to hear about like really brave, bold policies. And I know that that probably comes from a proportionally representative system where you're not fighting against like um, the hardship of being a small party and the, and the two party system. But um, but yeah, really fascinating. And also what you just said right at the end there about like the cyclical campaigning and about like uh, everyone's exhausted now, but it really has to carry on and that this is a forever thing that we're in now is um, is also something to think about. Um, so I usually just go through all of the presentations first, but we've got two hands up. How do we feel about that? Okay, people are thumbsing up. If you want to put your comment into the chat, and then if Seth's got written comments to answer any questions, he can, and then we will can come to them at the end again, and all of our speakers can then answer the questions, because sometimes it's good to get the different perspectives on what you're asking. So um sorry I didn't explain myself very well at the beginning but thank you for kicking us off I feel like we should go to Maria now I did have Mina Jack next but I feel like 
Seth's gone to Sweden and then you're in Sweden anyway, Maria. So I feel like, um, sorry, Mina, if that's all right with you, then uh, perfect. Okay, thank you for accommodating us. Okay, I will hand over to you. Hopefully you've got um, the power to share your slides and things. Amazing, I can see them. So off you go, Maria, thank you. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, yes, the Green Party in Sweden. Um, in Swedish, we say Miljöpartiet, the Gröna. Um, the env Environmental Party, the Green. So, if you. So, um, next slide. Uh, the Green Party in Sweden, uh, we have approximately 15,000 members. I'm not updated, but I think something like that. Uh, we have two party leaders whom we call spokespersons, uh, Amanda Lind and Daniel Heldén, both of whom are former municipal uh, councillors. Uh, Daniel was in Stockholm City and Amanda, she is from Härnösand, a city in northern part of Sweden. Um, and they are they have just been working about a year, so they are quite new persons. Uh, next slide. Short about the Swedish politics. Um, here is a picture from the Swedish Parliament's website. Uh, we have three dominant larger parties, one at right and one at the left. And we also have a far right party. Additionally, we have several smaller parties with different orientations that cooperate with the larger parties. This structure is reflected at the regional and local levels as well. The clear block politics. Do you say so? Is that right? Block politics. Yes, yeah, two blocks, yes. left and right blocks. Yes, yes. Uh, that prevails at the national level. It's not as pronounced at the local and regional levels, where all forms of cooperations exist. Unlike your system, we have one election every four years where we vote for all three levels on the same day. So that is uh, different. And that the parties are not used to campaign all the time. They just campaign one year before the elections and then it all downs. And then in two years, there are not so much campaign and then everybody campaigns again. And that's not so good. We can take next picture. Here is... Uh, uh, some results from the last four elections at the uh, national level and the EU level. During my time as municipal councillor, we, the Green Party, had 53 municipal and regional councillors. Today, there are fewer, perhaps around one third. So we have had a few years of headwinds in Sweden. Uh, Sweden, you can also see that uh, in Sweden we vote more green when it comes to long-term issues. Is it the same in UK? I can answer. It used to be when the UK had European elections, Greens was <laughs> third, second or third, I think, in the last European. Yes. Bigger oh. than the two main parties. Correct me the, green, uh, uh, the Green Party is strongest in the largest cities in Sweden and in cities with in universities and college. Uh, in some parts of Sweden, the Green Party has uh, so-called white areas that there are no active associations or individuals, uh, most in the north of Sweden, I could say, and some uh, in the bottom south. Yes, we can take next picture. 
but in Stockholm, in the EU election, the Green Party became the largest party. It's really exciting how the campaign unfolded. I think a part of the success is how we campaign. I think it's wonderful. Next, next uh, picture. In addition to voters engagement in climate and, and environmental issues, the Green Party in the Stockholm district has also been working with the Green Party's campaign method, how to win local elections since the last election in 2022, when we get received help from SET to get started. It's exciting that uh, it has yielded so good results and that the party is now campaigning in a much more structured and engaged way. Everyone who gets involved in politics has different motivations. Some want to become a politician, others love campaigning, and everyone is needed. As a party, we need to work to find ways to recommend this. this. There is so much to learn from each other from different countries, I think. In the election campaign 2022, we were visited by Pete Elliott, who participated in our campaign. We also sent a delegation to London. Uh, and we have also been to Berlin. And I think we have so much to learn from each other. We can take next uh, picture. We got so influenced by how to win local elections. So with this book, uh, um, and it's planned to be launched this fall, which is two years before our next election in Sweden, 2026. This is, will be a perfect start. And uh, it would be great to somehow coordinate the campaign school together between countries uh, within the Green Party, right? Together, we can uh, develop a campaign work, uh, share and learn new campaign methods and build something really good, I think. Uh, Pete Elliott, when, when he vis visited uh, Stockholm, he, he tried uh, our silent disco. I don't know if he had uh, tested, done that in, how I don't know where is he from? London, he... Lambeth in London. No. Okay, as uh, so I don't know if you know what silent disco is. It's high um, headphones, uh, who had three channels with music, so everybody can uh, listen to which music they like, and dance, and one person has some microphone and can speak with all the persons with headphones, and we were about. I think 60, 100 persons you can be. And uh, then you can go on the street a Saturday evening and dance and wear green clothes or something and have uh, signs or it's very funny. And uh, I, I know that Pete uh, want to do that in his own group. Um, I think, for example, of a Green Party joint campaign app where we can campaign together, see which countries are in campaign mode, observe how the Green Party is growing, share campaign activities with each other and learn from different countries about door knocking and what's trending, both campaign in the air and on the ground. 
there is clearly potential in a joint act so that campaign loving members of the Green Party can plan their vacations to countries and cities where campaigning is happening and how to contact the Green Party. Okay, we take next. In my role as a district office manager for the Green Party in Stockholm, in the Stockholm district, I have observed that uh, many part many part groups on local and regional level spend far too much time to administration, finance, and so on. Therefore, we have launched a small service company called Gröna Hissen, the Green Elevator, uh, where we have simplified, industri industrialized, and digital accounting processes. We have also provided service in finance and personal leasing to support the party na nationwide. It's growing and evolving and has proven to be very success successful. We also provide campaign service and perhaps in-house agency for the next, next election. Through Gröna Hissen, by helping local parties establish um, a stable foundation for their operations, I hope they will have more time to focus on politics, campaign and leading political work. Now I will move on discussing leadership in political work, something I have been involved in for many years before I become a civil servant. Leading in politics involve, involves challenges. And there is a difference between working and operating politically in majority, majority and opposition. I will conclude by briefly discussing this based on my experience as both a municipal councillor and a district office manager. Collaboration and handshakes between parties is built on trust and agreements where the parties and elected officials can truly rely on each other. This trust takes a long time to build. There are both unwritten and written rules in political work. And I have a specific presentation on this that I speak from often, uh, which we can take another time, if you're curious. The Greens in Sweden uh, have formed majorities with various colors of rainbow, locally and regionally, but have always cooperated with the Social de Democrats at the national level. There are likely several explanations for this, but Fundamentally, the Social Democrats sometimes struggle to collaborate with small parties on the local level because historically they have been so large and accustomed to making all the decisions themselves. Whereas smaller parties are more accustomed to negotiating and making agreements. Sometimes it's easier to make a handshake with the smaller parties. Uh, ma majority. Uh, if you are in a majority, the party holds responsibility for society, locally, regionally or nationally, and ultimately answers to all the citizens. There, there is always an agreement among several parties on what should be implemented in the handshake in a majority. Parties align their political documents and develop a common platform. Decisions are then made by the majority and not by the individual, individual party requiring this requiring structures and internal processes 
to be adjusted accordingly. This means that the party's political life is governed by this agreement, and which can be a balancing act at a member meeting with members who may not fully understand. It's crucial to clearly and effectively ensure majority agreements. It's also important to not to be issue driven. I don't know if that's the right word. Ärende stöd, is that issue driven? That sounds correct. Yes, meaning not letting upcoming agenda or meeting agendas dictate the party's work too much, but rather balancing this with the party's internal work. This is, I think, the most the hardest thing if you go into the majority. But if you, I think, many starts working in opposition, there's more enjoyable uh, because there are more artistic political freedom to address issues as they arise without being bound by any agreements or handshakes or res responsibility. One can devote time and energy to, energy to matters that capture members' interests to a greater extent. It's a, a big difference between the life, the political life in majority and the political life in opposition. Um, we can take the next picture. This is my last picture, I think. Uh, this is the ground for a good cooperation in my majority. It takes three things. Uh, a well-crafted shared political platform is essential for navigating challenges that arise along the way in a majority. It should be straightforward and comprehensive, allowing the party to confidently return to its voters and members, stating that it has achieved what it campaigned for. Uh, the platform should be formally decided upon a meeting, perhaps by a designed negotiation group, empowered by a mandate from a members meeting to negotiate. It's crucial that it's well rooted in support. And common rules of engagement are crucial between parties in a majority. Avoiding speaking ill of each other, defining responsibilities for each issue, handling disagreements between parties or politicians, making decisions within the majority, identifying a mediator, managing international internal protocols and controlling access to them. Having a closed room where the trust exists and parties can speak openly, it's beneficial for creating a stable platform for cooperation and making agreements. A communication plan is also vital. It outlines which party will communicate, which issues and when. It ensures all parties have a voice in communication and addresses how to handle disagreements in communication. Establishing a trust, a trusting collaboration is essential. So this was a few words about working in a majority, which I have done as a counselor. Um, yes, that was my last picture. I think I have one slide with my email if someone wants to contact me in some way. Thank you so much, Maria. I mean, I'm sure people will have questions at the end of the yes. um, at the end of the session as well. Um, but it was really interesting 
And also just very sad for us to hear about cooperative politics, I think, in the UK, because that doesn't happen here <laughs> very easily. I can see Seth and Mina um, laughing. Um, but it's it's true. And so it's very it's always lovely to hear when, um, you know, politicians and different parties work together um, on particular issues. Um, and I think, I mean, there's a few things that I noted down um, around the sim- similarities between uh, UK and Sweden, you know, around having two spokespeople, two co-leaders, both of them come in from councillor backgrounds. I think that's incredibly important for and why like leaders of organisations can do really well. Um, and especially with us with Carla and Adrian because of their experience um, as councillors and now as MPs, very important And then I just loved what you were saying around um, us all as European green parties, which will segue us perfectly into Mina Jack, um, campaigning together and learning from each other and sharing our learnings and sharing our successes. Um, And I'm organising the conference for the Green Party in the UK in September, and I am taking the Green Silent Disco to that conference okay that is out that's coming with us so okay thank you so much for your presentation and um like i say we'll come to the questions at the end our final speaker is mina jack tolu um who has stepped in at the last minute mina is a trans activist from malta uh with over 12 years of experience in developing campaigns and communications on lgbtqi rights and other social justice issues. Uh, They are a committee member of the European Green Party and deputy chair of ADPD, which is the Green Party in Malta. Uh, And Mina was recently a candidate in the European elections. So maybe we'll tell us a little bit about that experience (laughs) as well. Mina Jack, thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Yes, I'm really happy to be here. Actually, I was also taking notes during Seth's and Maria's presentations. I just want to make sure you can hear me. Everything is yes. Yeah, we can hear you fine. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Great. Again, because I'm not at home right now and I'm on my data, so I'm not sure the connection is always sure. Just flag it to me in case. Um, so thanks again for the invitation to the European Greens uh, to attend this. I'm sorry, Benedetta de Marte could not be here tonight. Uh, some other commitments came up. She's also a local councillor in Brussels. Uh, meaning she's juggling two very important roles, one as a local councillor and the other as the Secretary General of the European Greens, especially in a time post-European Parliament elections, post-UK elections, post-French elections, where many discussions are happening politically about where our movement goes next. Um, As uh, I kind of will start more from a local perspective, coming from the campaign uh, for the European elections on behalf of the Maltese Greens, which, um, well, to show you, to share like the struggles of small parties as well. I was actually following very closely the campaigns in the UK, also because my twin lives in Bristol and was very, very happy to be able to, well, vote green (laughs) and make it count, right? as well as following very closely the campaign in Brighton. Um, And it's very exciting to see the the on-the-ground work that's being done, the letter writing that is done, um, the door knocking that is done. And I think these are so many examples that our parties in Europe are not used to. I've been involved in campaigning um, for around 10 years now, first on a Maltese level and then more on a European level with the Federation of Young European Greens. And when we held trainings for the Federation of Young European Greens five years ago for the last European Parliament elections, we did have the Irish at that point come in and teach us about door knocking, right? Because it's a, it's a, it's a tactic that actually parties in Europe are not using because they say, well, that's not the culture, right? And well, who sets the culture of what a campaign is like is often the big parties that have more resources. But when we have less resources, we need to be a bit more creative. And if the old, if the main resource we have is volunteer time, how are we going to use that? It was really great to see uh, that Seth was up on list building and using list building already uh, quite early on. 
as the European Greens, we have the platform called Tilt. Tilt's platform is a petition platform uh, primarily where we host uh, Europe-wide petitions. Um, our most popular was one to actually ban and stop octop octopus farming in Spain. Um, yes. Um, great to see Councillor Johnny uh, mentioning the local council network of the European Green Party. I will also talk about that because it is actually one of our most exciting projects, I believe. But so as the Tilt platform, with again, our most popular uh, petition being to ban octopus farming in, the, in, in Spain and everywhere in Europe, really, um, the thought of farming octopus just really scary, actually, honestly, at the moment you start reading about how, how sent, like, how, how vastly intelligent these creatures are. Um, but it's also a list building platform in that in many countries where petitions are actually a successful way to campaign, we've actually been able to build our list in a multilingual way. And we've been doing that for over five years. And now in in 2024, we were able to utilize those lists during the election. And noting that, though, however, that the lists were much more successful in Western European countries than in other European countries. So we were able to build a kind of petition base that could also get excited about the European elections. And that is why we, we decided as a European Green Party committee to also put the vote for our 12th priority to to the tilt list um who chose um right to access clean water as the 12th priority of the european greens amongst many many different things but so this kind of campaigning that we do at the european level though is, is quite challenging because on the one hand we are trying to support local candidates um in various ways um but on the other hand, we're limited by many bureaucratic uh, kind of requirements of the European Parliament on what we can or cannot do in a country, right? Because uh, funding for the European Greens comes primarily through the European uh, Parliament. So that funding needs to be used and follow certain regulations and guidelines. And therefore, we cannot run adverts, for example, on Facebook in every country. And we need to be careful how we organize events and make sure that they have an international focus so we cannot come or we cannot go to malta and just host an event in malta that benefits the maltese greens if it doesn't benefit as well uh member parties from other countries as well and if it doesn't have an international focus and so obviously this has these constraints challenge us to be creative with the ways we campaign um and having two lead candidates in the past elections, Terry Reintke from the German Greens and Bas Eichhardt from the Dutch Greens, allowed us to reach a broad base across different countries, going into almost every country where we have a member party that were campaigning for the European Parliament and supporting events there. They they held pub events, pub quizzes, um, which which I think is is quite exciting to host a pub night and have an MEP and a lead candidate for the European Greens who's likely going to be remain an MEP and get quite a high position within the Green Group, actually having a sitting down and having a beer at uh, someone's local pub and being able to chat about the topics that we're working on most, like climate change, uh, green and social deal with uh, just regular citizens, right? I think one of the biggest challenges that we faced as well is what do we do with the diaspora vote? Um, now, I think there are some parallels here with some perhaps UK challenges, because in the UK, uh, Commonwealth citizens who are residents in the UK can register to vote, right? And a lot of my Maltese friends who live in the UK and are resident in the UK did register to vote and were very excited to vote in an election where it felt like something would count, right? Something would matter their votes actually had a, a say, even though we know that the, the, the system in the UK is not proportional. Um, but it was very exciting for me to see my Maltese friends who are resident in the UK 
actually exercising their vote rights to vote there. And so one of the challenges for the European Greens within the European Parliament elections was actually thinking, how do we reach a diaspora in different countries? And how does this benefit our member parties? Because perhaps reaching the 40,000 Italians who live in Malta, perhaps 20,000 of those who have a vote, could be super beneficial, beneficial for the Maltese Greens. But is it more crucial for the Italian Greens to get those votes, right? So how are we going to communicate to people who have made another European member state their home? And how are we going to communicate to them about how to vote and when to vote? And unfortunately, the individual member states make it very challenging because while the rules in Malta are one way that you need to register by the end of March to be on the electoral register, in other countries, you need to be registered by January in order to vote in June. And in some other countries, you just need to turn up with your residence documents. And so this makes it really challenging to think like, what does a, a European campaign look like? And what could a European campaign look like in the future, right? So I've just mentioned a few of the tools that, that we use, like TILT, like having lead candidates to allow us to hold international and Europeanized events in terms of, of the funding we receive as well. Um, now, when it comes to local councils, of course, it's even more challenging. So we have the local councils network. Essentially, it's a social media for green local councillors. So if you're a local councillor, um, I, I will have a look at your questions after. But if you're a local councillor, you can join in on this website and uh, you can attend webinars with international speakers. You can chat in various uh, groups uh, based on regional uh, or groupings based on topics that you are interested uh, to implement at the local council level and find like-minded councillors from other countries that might have some great ideas that you can borrow, uh, that you can be inspired by, and that you can start to implement in your own localities. I found it really useful, even though I'm not a local councillor, as a member of the committee, I am on that, on that social media network, and I let people know when I'm travelling to their city so that we can meet and have a chat about the work of the European Greens and how we can support uh, local councillors. And in fact, when I visited my twin in Bristol last year, I got to meet Carla and a number of other local councillors in Bristol, which was really exciting for me um, to chat with them about their plans right, for the future of Bristol and then obviously Carla's plans for the election. Um, so it allows you to connect with many, many councillors where actually on a local level, Greens do really well. Um, and when we start doing really well on a local level, uh, we can start to achieve results also at the national uh, level or at the municipal level. But I, I know I'm speaking to the converted here because your results in the local elections in the UK were just phenomenal. And it just was such an inspiration to so many of our campaigners and members. Um, so just as a, a last mention, perhaps is, um, well, uh, what happens to Greens when we get in government? Um, Greens in government always govern in coalitions. Um, and so Maria was already talking about this, right? What are the kind of conversations that Greens are having in order to enter into coalitions? And what are the results of those coalitions? And I follow the Irish Greens quite closely on social media. Um, and they've just shared like how emissions have gone down in Ireland. And that is also thanks to their leadership, right? As part of a coalition. However, um, they also lose out. We see the German Greens lost quite a percentage of their vote in the last European Parliament elections compared to the previous ones when they were not in coalition. And actually the German Greens in, in, in government have suffered a lot, the public perception of who the Greens are and what they can achieve when they are in leadership positions in a state. And this has been quite a shock um, and quite hard when so many of our members uh, within the member parties are activists, are coming perhaps from the climate movement, are coming from the LGBTQI movement, are coming from uh, social justice movements like right to housing. And when we're in government somewhere and we slightly have to compromise on those goals that the activists, our very own members set, 
then we start to lose out. Um, and we start to be considered as a more moderate, perhaps, party, a more centrist party, and and we lose votes. And however, the, you know, it's kind of this kind of play that we're going to see in France now. Like, what are the Greens going to do in France? They do have a nice number of seats. They are part of the Nouveau Front Populaire, which is, which is great. And it was a way that as a, a coalition running together, um, as, as a union of different parties on the left, they were able to beat the far right fantastically with an amazing campaign in such a short time. But now there are big questions on the table because there is going to be no majority. Uh, there's, there is no clear majority. Um, and the Greens seem to be playing themselves. Well, Marie Candelier seems to be playing a very, uh, you know, uh, she's pushing a message of the need to compromise in a situation when we are facing a far right that is growing so much in France. And she comes from a background where she was uh, elected in a in a, re- in a in a city that is dominated by the far right. So she's had this direct experience of campaigning directly, right, against the far right. And, and she is really pushing for like, you know, we need to know when we talk, who we talk with at table and how to maintain what we call the cordon sanitaire. So how do we maintain that rope against the far right and ensure that they do not get positions of leadership in a country? And sometimes we're going to have to compromise on some of our values to do that. Now, of course, that's very difficult for people like many Green members who join the Greens, not because it's popular, not because it's fun, not because, you know, but it's just because it's the right thing to do, because they match our values, because, you know, there's no other party that we feel fully represents who we are. And then there are these questions. So so it's going to be really interesting to follow what happens in France. Uh, I am following as much as I can, although my French is very elementary. Um, and I do encourage you all to keep on looking at that because I think we, you know, France is a place that is not known for cooperative politics. Um, like the UK is not known for cooperative politics, but hopefully they would be setting a standard and setting a new way for how the left in particular and the center left should be should be talking to each other. There's some people watching the game behind me. It's very distracting. Um, so, but thank you all for not watching the game tonight to to be on this call. Um, yeah. Anyway, so that was like a broad a broad overview. When it comes to fighting the far right, we have our Greens in the European Parliament. Unfortunately, our group is amongst one of the smaller ones this time round, and the far right are split into it seems two or three groups. It's unsure exactly what is happening. The Identity and Democracy Group, which used to be where the German far right sat, kicked out the German far right, and therefore the German far right is building their own group. Um, it's all very complicated and, and very hard to follow this kind of juggling of parties within the ECR, the ID, former ID, uh, and the new patriots led by Orban, for example. And it's it's... You know, um, I know that the Green MEPs are being very strong with Ursula von der Leyen. If she chooses to ally with the ECR, which are considered like the softest far right, right? Um, Then she does not have the support of the Greens. So the cordon sanitaire, that rope around the far right, needs to start from the ECR. The ECR is where the Tories used to sit. And it's where uh, Meloni's party from Italy sits. Um, Meloni's party recently under attention in Italy uh, because her youth wing have been making Nazi salutes and shouting fascist uh, slogans in in their parties, uh, in their party events. So, you know, we can't say, we can't say the ECR is like softer than the others. But when we look at the voting record as well, of the past five years of the European Parliament, a majority of the times the ECR voted exactly like identity and democracy, meaning the ECR was voting exactly like the group which had parties like the AFD and Salvini's party, Lega. So so in, 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 the, in the European Parliament, the discussions are ongoing this week. I know this today 
the Green Group in the European Parliament had a meeting with Ursula von der Leyen and with Roberta Metsola to set our agenda and let them know what our red lines are. And so we'll continue to follow that over the next few weeks to see exactly what will happen and therefore what weight our voice will have at the European Parliament as well. Thank you so much, Mina Jack, for um, a commentary on all the different layers of European politics, not only what you've just gone through with the with the with the European elections, but local and more national based uh, politics as well. I think um, what you were just saying right at the end there about you know voting records don't lie. People, I mean the. the People do it in UK politics all the time, you know, like individuals, especially in the two big parties. I believe this. I think that I believe in proportional representation. And it doesn't matter because they're in the parties that have whips. And therefore, it doesn't matter what you think on an individual basis because you will be told how to vote. And I think that's so many parties, whether on a national European level, try and uh, make themselves to be like perceive themselves as something that they're not when it comes to their voting record and and like you were saying that is really why I was drawn to the Greens and why so many people will be drawn to the Greens because we practice what we preach and we we try and stand by exactly what we believe in but as soon as like you were saying cooperative poli politics comes into it and rainbow coalitions come into it then compromise is is with a capital c in that in that situation and i think that is really really fascinating so uh thank you so much for giving us your perspective and um a little taster of what things are like in brussels right now and i know brussels is just about to have local elections as well now so i'm sure that you're just gearing up again um for that so fascinating Okay, so we have had some questions in and what usually happens is I will ask the person who's asked the question in the chat to unmute themselves and read out the question and then any of our um, presenters feel free to um, jump in. So either it's like the first one to unmute themselves or just put your hand up uh, and I will um, invite you to answer the question. But everyone is is welcome to have a say on this from our speakers so Liz Hillary you are our first question if you want to unmute yourself hi 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 Seth nice to see you um yeah I just assuming that there's no you don't get that sort of campaigning from the larger parties about splitting the vote in in any of the countries we've had represented here that's just not an issue there's no such thing um what we have instead is a lot of speculation about coalitions. So voters would like to know in advance which co which likely coalitions are going to be formed. Um, and yeah. it differs from country to country, but in Norway, uh, the Greens have positioned ourselves between the two left and right blocks to be kingmaker, which has advantages and disadvantages. It means a bit like in England or Wales, we can take votes from any party and yeah. incredibly, um, and it gives us a lot more we punch above our weight in, in negotiations. But if you are very traditionally left, particularly if you're very traditionally left, you have other parties you could vote for that you would guarantee that you would never go on a collision with parties of the right. I have to say that what we consider the right in Norway is not is is very like leftist in most other countries. It's like okay. paying the welfare. No, so. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but I also noticed, uh, was interested to see, you still got to convince people you're going to win. It's when you're so, campaigning you know greens have been in around in norway for 30 years and it, people didn't take us seriously until the last 10 years when mm -hmm. we you have to win and show people you can win and maintain that winner effect um the other parties are not our friends you know another thing to say they 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 they're constantly telling us to you know calm down and not campaign so hard because they want to take back their vote share you know and they know that as yeah. you know, greens are quite nice people so that we, we're willing to listen and say, oh, you're right. Yeah, we'll, we'll be, we can never listen to that. <laughs> okay. Hi, Liz. Great. Thanks for your Thank question. You. Um, from a Maltese perspective, that is the message that the Greens get. Uh, essentially, the two big parties, very similar to the UK, Labour and Conservative, right, um, are saying that a vote for the Greens is a wasted vote. 
and have actually engaged in misinformation campaigns over the past 20 years or more uh, to kind of fool people uh, into not really knowing how the electoral system works and not really understanding the impact of your vote. And so, you know, they, you know, I think the Labour Party would rather people stay at home than go out and vote to another party. And therefore, they're not going to push out with a get out of the vote, get out the vote campaign. And they're not going to push out informative campaigns of how to vote and, and the value of a vote and like democratic values, right? Because this actually <laughs> doesn't benefit them. And so absolutely yeah. like this idea that if, it, if an election is going to be close between like Labour and our conservatives, which we call nationalists, if 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 the election is going to be close between them of a few seats, we'll see less votes go to the green because people really, really, really are going to try and make a choice between two evils, in my opinion, and choose yeah. the lesser evil rather than go for what they actually want. And, mm -hmm. and that's really tough. Maria, did you want to join? Thanks, thanks, Mina, and thanks, Seth. I think it's similar to Norway in Sweden. Um... Yeah. You don't have that issue then? You don't have people saying you're going to split the vote if you vote green? No. And there is a difference in Sweden between the national level and the local. Um, on the local level, there is all kind of um, cooperation. <laughs> but um, on the national level, the Green always cooperate with the, the social de democrats. So on the yeah. left side. Um, yeah. but there are different, I think, I don't know exactly, but I think <laughs> that uh, there are more majorities with the right side and the Greens in Sweden on the local level mm -hmm. than, than majorities on the left side. I think so. Because I, I, I described that the social democrats is sometimes hard to handshake with because you, all, you don't know. So on the local level, we often don't choose to work with them. Right. Great question, Liz. And um, thanks to our speakers for answering. Okay, our next question comes from Peter Carter. Peter, if you want to ask your question to the speaker. Right. Well, I put my question down before hearing uh, Maria Schellbauer's particularly interesting presentation, which many thanks. Um, I was going to ask about what was your experience of working with other parties? And I'm particularly interested here in which other parties do you find it easiest to work with? And are there particular issues uh, upon which it is, it is easier to work than others? Huh. Well, <clears throat> that depends on the person's uh, on the local level, um, in an ordinary municipal, um, there are in not so many persons. So in the end, it is about the persons. If a person, you can rely on a person or not. Um, so that that's the reason that it, it can... Uh, change and people a party um, make their their decision about who they can work with according to which, which person they can rely on okay. so this is as simple as that <laughs> <laughs> thanks maria to mina jack or seth would you like to come back on that question? I think at the European Parliament, um, there is a lot of cross party work, but it happens in committees. And so your individual MEPs get to know individual MEPs from other groups on a specific topic. So, for example, right now I was speaking to Erasmus uh, Northfist from 
from Denmark and, and he's going to be on the committee on budget, env environment and fishing, fisheries, right? And so on the fisheries committee, for example, he's going to get to know um, individual MEPs from other groups, including uh, the European People's Party, right? The center right, including the SND, the Socialists and Democrats. And on within those committees, within certain specific discussions, there might be collaboration with them that goes beyond collaboration with them at any other level, right? And so it really also comes down to the individual people and what they are there for. Like some MEPs get elected, regardless of the group or the party, right? Because of specific areas of interest and knowledge and expertise uh, that they might be bringing with them. So I know one of the Maltese MEPs from the Socialists and Democrats from the Labour Party in Malta has expertise in fishing policy, right? And so he's going to sit in that fishing group probably, and he's probably going to sit side by side with Rasmus, and they're probably going to have a lot of conversations that they might actually agree on um, and therefore be able to work on. But then in other groups, they wouldn't work together because maybe they would not agree on the same approach to other topics. So, so it really comes down to individual level as well. When we come to votes at the European level, oh, and the idea of having a whiff, it's very UK. Uh, the Maltese have adopted it as well, that you have a party whip. But many of our, our many countries in the EU do not have this concept in their, in, in their politics. And they do allow free votes to their members uh, on certain issues and certain topics. And, and, and so, so, yeah, so we see a lot more flexibility between individuals uh, than you might think. Um, and so at the, the European Parliament, the way it works is, you know, I remember asking Ska Keller, a uh, former German Green MEP, quite high up. I remember asking her, like, you know, do you know any Maltese MEPs? And she was like, I just know one of them because she happens to be on the same committee with me. Otherwise, I probably wouldn't have never encountered one, right? Because none of them are in the Greens. So, so, so it comes down to individuals as well. And that's cooperation that's very soft, very informal cooperation. You might lobby as many social democrats as possible for one or two votes or or more on a certain report votes within the committee before they reach the full parliament there's many different levels in which negotiations are happening that would not be happening elsewhere and additionally the green group of the european parliament is not just the green group of the european parliament otherwise we would be small and we would probably be one of the smallest groups in the european parliament so we do have a uh, vault Europe sitting with us, for example, we do have the European Free, Free Alliance, EFA, sitting with us and a number of MPs from, from, from their member parties. We have some individual independent MEPs like uh, Stefan Uta from, from Romania that sit with the Green Group. So, so it's a lot more collaborative at the European level than it is at any other level that I've seen. And that makes it really interesting in terms of the coalitions that are forming that are soft and non-formal and the negotiations that are happening and the mediation that is happening that is is much more on a one-to-one -one level and who you know and what relationships you've built rather than on a, I'm from the Greens and you're from s and and therefore we're not going to collaborate on this topic. Thanks, Mina Jake. All the important conversations happen in the smoking room. That's in the in the smoking area of the of the pubs, pubs and the bars in, in Brussels. Thanks, Seth. I would just like to add, uh, yeah, P Peter, yeah, the experience has been good in a way. In fact, maybe too, it's been too cozy. You know, it can go the other way. And actually, um, you know, voters can get tired of the same coalition over a number of years. And it becomes very, there's a habit, you know, when you know, as Maria said, the individuals involved, the idea of actually after the election, working with a different coalition becomes something that is resisted by the parties. And that can really cost in terms of the vote share. So that's that's a bit of an unfortunate learning. I, I always like to tell the story about the Social Democrats as well, who have always been very patronizing. And at the beginning of the election in 2019, they came to us and they heard that we had these big ambitions and they said, we don't think it's a good idea for you to, to, to aim so high, you know, it'll only go badly for you. And we need to maintain this coalition. So don't aim high. Well, we ignored them. And then by the end of the campaign, in certain polls, we were bigger. We were polling higher than they were. And they were, be they were basically begging us to to stop stealing all their voter. So, um, but yeah, I think it's, it's sad what happened in 2020. Yeah, the last local elections here because 
they got kicked out of power in Oslo because it was too cozy and the voters wanted they wanted to change. You know, renewal is a, is a democratic, it's part of the democratic process. And Greens, we can get sucked down by the boring parties if we're not careful. Okay. Great question, Peter. Thank you for that. And thank you to our speakers. Okay, Did you have something? Could yeah. I just say that um, <clears throat> Mina's description of what goes on in the committees of the European Parliament is that we see some of that in the select committees in Parliament in our country, uh, that MPs in that forum often find it easy to work together, even though they're from different, uh, different parties, uh, when they're focusing on a particular subject. Absolutely. As we've seen with Caroline Lucas, who was the sole green voice and has had to use those select committees to um, influence the, the different parties in power, I think um, it's a lot easier behind closed doors. We can all be friends behind closed doors, can't we? And we can all be very civil. And then when it comes to being in the spotlight, we, everyone turns into Nigel Farage and um, goes for the for the yes, no politics of, of in Britain anyway. And all they can talk for is Britain. Um. Fantastic question. Okay, thank you. So the next comment was from Johnny Dini. He was encouraging people to engage with the European uh, Local Councillors Network. It's a really great network. It gives you the opportunity to travel within Europe. Um, he's also a part of the Council of Europe group um, and would be very interested in meeting up with people uh, in Europe and is very pro-Europe. And I mean, aren't we all in the Greens, but especially in <laughs> The UK Greens. So, um, so yes, that's what that is. And I've dropped the link into the uh, programs and networks of the European Greens because they do have a lot of interesting things going on there. So the next question is from Lynn. I think Mina Jack maybe touched on this a little bit uh, in their speech, in their in their presentation. But I think it will be interesting to get the other perspectives as well. And I'm sure we can all talk about the rise of the far right and how we don't want it um, until the cows come home. Lynn. Thank you. And thanks to the speakers. This has been been really interesting because I think we tend to sort of look inward and just stay within the UK, um, especially now that we're not members of the EU, unfortunately. Um, and my question is not, I, I would like to just hear what people think, what their thoughts are about what we need to be doing um, and if there's any strategy that's being developed right now. But what your thoughts are about what we need to be doing um, to counter the, the far right. And I, I think I I worry, I think it's a big elephant in the room. And and here in the UK, Reform UK, which is a fairly new party, um, did relatively well, but they, they only got five MPs and they still get a lot more oxygen than we get, a lot more attention than we get with her, our big win with four. But I my fear is that like the Labour Party. Um, and the conservatives as well, because we did get votes from conservative voters in this last election and in the last local election here in Stroud, but that they will use the specter of the far right to um, to scare people away from voting green. And it could have a real impact on us because we've seen that happen here where they say, if you don't vote for labor, you'll get the conservatives. And they still use that messaging, even though they were um, destined for a landslide vote here. Um, but with the rise of the far right, I think it's going to be even a more powerful message to people. I'm already hearing people here saying we can't vote for PR. We can't push for you know, a, a reformed voting system because that will just give more MPs to the far right, which I think is a really dangerous um, perspective for us to have for something we've been fighting for. So just basically people's thoughts about what we should be doing as a green movement to counter the far right. Would it be okay if I start because my battery is getting low and, and I'm going to have to... Yeah, leave. please do. Please do. Um, yeah. So I think we can't use anti-democracy messages against the far right in the sense of suddenly being against uh, proportional representation because of the threat of the far right is, is, is absolutely ridiculous. Like this whole time we campaign for democracy and this whole time we campaign to listen to people and to voters and to just kind of excuse all of this and find an easy way out by keeping a system broken 
it's not going to help. And it's just showing that we've not done our work on the ground. Um, I think that um, the most important thing is to activate our base and uh, build those connections and build community and actually listen to community. So allow there to be two channels of communication and not just be it that after a campaign, we're just talking down to people about what we believe should happen. And we're just in our, in Europe, in a European sense, we just stay stuck in the Brussels bubble. So maybe in the UK, you just stay stuck in London and you don't actually listen to what's happening in rural areas because in rural areas is where the far right is actually able to gather a lot more ground. And this is where like, we look at Hungary, for example, Budapest is fine. Budapest elected a green mayor. Everywhere out of Budapest is a huge problem, right? And we look at um, um, the UK as well, I guess. I mean, all of all of London was red, right? But what's happening beyond London? And we look at Brussels, and it's like within the Brussels bubble here, we're so smart that just sitting in our in our expensive cafes, and having a coffee together, or having a glass of wine after work and pontificating about, oh, oh dear, the, the rise of the far right, when it's not impacting any of us directly as working in Brussels or any of that, um, but it is impacting people on the ground. So unless we maintain those channels of communication open with not just our members, but more, more people and make sure we are listening to the real concerns on the ground, they're going to go somewhere that seems to be listening to them. Um, I'd say one of the big questions on the table for the European Greens is TikTok. We've seen actors like Nigel Farage become huge on TikTok, right? Be able to build these huge bases of followers through um, really like catchy, good use of reels and, and short videos uh, without much political content to them. But it's a way to channel people to start listening to their political content and to legitimize their political content. So we definitely need a much stronger digital strategy to reach uh, to reach young people and and politicize them and understand that, you know, if you're not going to get involved in politics, politics is going to fuck you over eventually. Excuse my language. But um, so that's one of the big challenges we're seeing as European Greens is the digital fight. That's where we're losing the most. The digital fight. And then where we where we continue to lose, and it's it's been it's been the case for years where democrat well where democratic forces lose to the far right is in rural areas, and so we need to continue looking in these spaces and holding conversation and and being a conversation. Thanks, Mina. That's great answer. Can I don't worry about language on this channel. Yes, um, Seth. Yes, please do. Oh, that was such a great answer, Amelia Jack. Thank you. I agree with what you were saying. Um, so one of the things I find quite uh, exciting is is hearing about what progressives have been doing in the US to try and connect with Trump voters. Basically, you have a very polarized situation over there. And um, I've been reading about deep canvassing, which I'm not sure anybody's heard of, is basically seeking out people who are seemingly diametrically opposed to progressives. You know, so in the in England and Wales, it would be going through your canvassing returns and finding all the UKIP or reform voters and specifically going out to have conversations with them. And those conversations need to uh, take time. It's called deep canvassing. And they, they're very much based on listening and having no agenda and um, allowing people to to express themselves and come to their own conclusions. And I think really that a lot of the explanation of where the far right it seems to be gaining popularity is they seem to be offering something different and they seem to be engaging and listening and talking about the everyday issues mm -hmm. and the main parties are not doing that and we could be you know um i think uh so so the uh, polls in, in norway say that young people actually we have a kind of a mild far-right party who've been in government they're still scary and, and frankly uh i must be careful what i say legally but like they have very discriminatory issues on the issues but they are offering their retail offering okay what they're saying to young voters is we can we can reduce your taxes we can get you you know a cheap apartment we can uh, all these things you know alcohol will be more available these kind of things that appeal to people because it's so concrete and it's so short term so we need to be working on our retail offering for example for greens that is cheaper public transport or free public transport you know like they've, we've done in in scotland 
So we have to answer with those things and not like structural and uh, mm -hmm. abstract. It has to be real and short term. Um, yeah, that's what I wanted to add. Thanks, so. yes. Maria. Yes, it's, uh, I think, um, how to win local elections. Um, that book you have in UK, the Green Party. Uh, I think if uh, everybody worked from that book uh, and the party builds on the local level um, and we have to build some kind of infrastructure, not nationally. I think we should have a worldwide green infrastructure uh, helping each other. Um, so the subjects that you discuss, the political subject is different in the local level and the national level in every country. Um, so the infrastructure uh, will not uh, uh, rely to the subject, uh, how to discuss it. How we how we work with the politics. So I think I I'm totally sold out in how to win local elections, and I think that could help the Green Party in every country if we could learn to work together. Amazing! Thank you so much, Maria, and everybody. I think. You know, the key message through all of those is building trust again. And I think that a lot of people are very hurt by politicians and whether it was by green politicians or other politicians, it takes a lot for people to trust us. And, and that's why local politics works so well, because we're there and we're present and we work hard for our communities. And that is why, you know, councillors, regional politics is so important, just like you said, Maria. Um, and when that works well, that's when you can win nationally. That's what we've just done here in the UK. And when that works well, again, it impacts what happens on a European scale, because that's what Mina Jack was saying about how the Germans being in government this time, it's actually impacted them quite seriously in terms of their European success. So um, I'm not seeing Mina Jack anymore. So maybe their own run out. It's five to anyway I think I'm going to um leave it there I think it's been a fantastic discussion really interesting lots of different perspectives on what is something that affects us all in our everyday life I mean I loved what Mina Jack said at the end <laughs> like whatever happens politics is gonna get you and it will and it's gonna get you and it's gonna get your children and it's gonna get your families and there's nothing that isn't related to or affected by or impacted by politics. Um, what we do, whether you like and share tweets, whether you knock on doors, whether you support local politicians, every single part of that machine is so important because the other machines have lots more money and lots more resources. And so all we have is people's time and people's energy. And the fact that we all, you all give that to, to green politics is a really beautiful thing and um let's hope that we keep doing that and i think that we need at the next european council we need a meeting and we need to sort out this how to win elections global team that's what we need to do joining the global greens exists other people outside of europe need our help people within europe need our help um Let's do it. I know Seth's on board already. Maria sounds like she's on board already. I'm sure that we can get lots of other people there as well. So thank you, everybody, for joining us. Enjoy the last half of the football, if that's what you're going to spend your time doing. If not, then um, get to bed. And we will, we're having a pause over the summer. There'll be no August Cloud Cafe. We'll be back in September. I'm sure it'll be just as interesting and, fa uh, and fascinating. And thank you, as always, to our speakers and the people who organize this, Elizabeth especially, and everybody else who puts time and effort into it. Um, it's a great way to connect. Thanks, guys. Have a lovely summer. Thank you. Bye-bye-bye.